Okay. And it's, well, we'll check. We'll check on the Facebook, on my Facebook to see if it's on there. How was your day today? Uh, days are good. You know, we are less than two weeks out now. And so every day is just a, a new roller coaster. Okay. Um, have, you, have you been pretty busy? Yes, and I see that we are live. Okay. okay fantastic. <laughs> so hello, everyone. This is attorney Robin McCoy, and we have our special guest, Ranjeev Puri, who is running for state rep. Um, I, Ranjeev, I know you won the primary, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so everyone, this is Robin Legal. You know, we have political coffee. We're coming back. Uh, we've been we were on a little hiatus, but we're coming back. So I'm coming back doing Robin Legal. And, um, you know, we'll be coming back with attorney Tracy Martin uh, doing some programming as well. Uh, so so Ranjeev, I know that uh, our current state rep, Chrissy Pagan, had been reaching out to me. She wanted me to connect with you. And it's just been crazy busy, but I said I was gonna, we're gonna make sure we connect. And um, so why don't you tell the audience some things about yourself? Like, uh, where are you from? Where did you go to school? I know I've, I have your website, I've looked at some of it, but just let let the audience know. Cool, yeah, well, I mean, first off, I mean, thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be on Robin Legal. Um, and I'm so happy that we found the time to do this. Um, and so, but yeah, just, you know, a little bit about myself, I guess, uh, for those that, uh, that that haven't heard my story. Um, I am a father. I got two small boys. I uh, am married. My wife has a small business here. And uh, I am the uh, son of, of immigrants. And so my parents uh, came to this country nearly 50 years ago. And uh, you know, those two lovebirds could have opened up a map and uh, settled anywhere between New York City and San Diego. And, uh, and they picked the heart of America's dairy land. And so I was born in Racine, Wisconsin, uh, many years later. Okay, and where did your parents come from? Yeah, so they they actually uh, they came from northern India, um, and it was so what part? Because I've been to India, I've been to, I've I've lived in Africa, Europe, France, and I've been oh, to India. So what part of India? So they were in uh, northern India in a state called Punjab. Oh, okay, um, oh, I'm familiar. Which is uh, the northwest side of India between uh, Pakistan and and India, and okay. um, and so life was uh, I mean it was a big change. I mean for anyone who immigrated in that period, doesn't matter what part of the world you're coming from, there was no Google and YouTube to kind of figure out what you were getting into. I mean, they, anyone, um, I mean, any immigrant story is tough, um, but just kind of listening to theirs and, 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 and people who immigrated in those years in the late 60s, early 70s, um, it was just, you know, you had to, they mortgaged everything they had and it was just kind of a, a one-way ticket to a foreign land and to try to build a life. And so it was just, uh, um, I, you know, it's, it's always just remarkable to hear what people had to do. And then you said you were born in Wisconsin, like what part of Wisconsin? Yeah, so I was born in uh, outside of Milwaukee in a, in a small town of Racine, uh, Racine, Wisconsin. Um, so no one's ever really heard of Racine. Um, there's not much claim to fame there. But uh, my um, godmother is actually the one who had better foresight. And so she bought a home in Canton, Michigan um, in the early 80s. And so we moved around a lot, but uh, Canton was always kind of a second home growing up. Okay. And then where did you go like for high school, college? I know you have like an MBA, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we moved around a lot. So I've been in the Midwest my whole life. And uh, okay. at some point in my life, I've actually lived in uh, Ohio, um, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin. Um, and so I, uh, I got my MBA from, um, I, I, I spent the better part of my life growing up in Ohio, I guess my childhood. And then I got my MBA from the University of Chicago um, after I had a chance to work with Obama. And so Finished that, and then my wife and I moved back to Michigan in like 2013 ish. Well, University of Chicago in the house because I went there for my undergrad. And then where did you oh, yeah? go? Yeah, okay. where did you go for undergrad? So I was in Ohio at uh, Ohio State. Actually. Oh, Ohio State. Okay. And um, yeah, I was at University of Chicago uh, when Obama got his picture in the background. But he was teaching constitutional law at the law school, and Michelle uh, was like an associate dean, and she actually helped me with my law school application. Uh, oh, so, yeah, so awesome. I knew them before they before they became rock stars. Now they're like yeah. rock stars. That's and um, but but I know in, in your commercial you said you did work. You so you worked in the Obama administration. Yeah. So uh, um, throughout kind of my travels in the Midwest, I, my wife and I found ourselves in Chicago in in uh, 2000. 
seven. And so uh, it was at that time I got <clears throat> the chance to work on this first campaign. And so being in Chicago, uh, working for Obama during the Obama years, which is, I mean, just transcendent. And so it fundamentally changed the way I view things. And so um, I did whatever I could then to get a staff position on his 2012 reelection campaign, which was also in Chicago. And so I was on kind of more of the finance and budget side um, for that okay. for that run. Okay. And then, uh, so what has brought you, what has made you decide to run for office? There's so much. I mean, there, you know, I, I you know, a lot of candidates have like this, like one particular story where they like kind of knew. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't think I have those, but I've had a series of just incidents and events um, my whole life that I just think have kind of just built up, built me up to this. I never was one of those people that knew I was going to do this my entire life. Um, but, you know, kind of going back to my parents' story a little bit. So when they moved to Wisconsin and they came from northern India, you know, they came to a land where there wasn't a ton of people who looked there or really thought like them. And so they just had to make a ton of friends and build a community um, from the ground up. And so and I had a kind of a front row seat in watching them do that. And so part of that meant they actually started uh, culturally. We are of the Sikh faith. Oh. And so they actually started the first Sikh, Sikh temple or Gurdwara um, in the state of Wisconsin. Okay. Um, and and so as I was working for President Obama um, and they and they did this like in the 70s. And so as I was working for President Obama in 2012, there was an incident which um, I don't know if you recall, but in August of 2012, there was a shooting where a white supremacist um, came in to a Sikh Gurdwara in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, which is the, you know, the, the community in which my parents started that first temple. And so a number of the lives that were lost that day. Uh, were very close family friends, people who attended my wedding, um, and just, you know, and, you know, our, our country has a gun violence issue, and I think that's a whole separate conversation, unfortunately, but um, it was, that was the moment in which I knew um, that I, I, I had to, I had to make a bigger difference, um, and so, you know, it, it's really hard to obviously hear stories of any mass shootings or, or gun violence, right. but to turn on CNN or whatever channel and see your loved ones, you know, grieving, um, and it just, it just hits different. And, and, you know, and it was only in the news cycle for like 12 hours and I was just really disheartened and disappointed with the lack of coverage. Um, and I felt that part of that was due just to lack of representation that there was for, for communities, um, that, are, that have just been largely disenfranchised. And so, yeah, um, I, I do remember hearing about that. I'm sad to hear that you had, uh, friends in, um, you know, that were connected to that. Um, you know, I have studied about, Hinduism, uh, you know, as I said, I've been to India. I actually took a class on Africa, India. And so um, you said Sikh. I know some people call it Sikh. Americans call it Sikh. Um, and then, um, yeah, so it's it's just ignorance. You know, you have people, some people mistaken people who are Sikh uh, as, as Muslim. Um, they should be doing it, whether you're Muslim or Christian or whatever you are, it should, you should be able to be in America and not have to deal with, um, xenophobia or racism you know yeah and uh, i mean robin you're hitting it on the head with that uh i mean that's that's exactly actually what happened in this case uh where the the white supremacist who came in with an assault rifle thought he was actually going into a mosque and he thought he was killing uh muslims um and so you know he was wrong on many different levels and so just like you said it, it doesn't matter who you're killing um it's not it's not the america that my parents came here for it's not the america that i grew up it's not the values that i think any of us um, cherish about our, our beautiful country. And so um, th there's just things like that that are just value driven that I I think that we just need to have a bigger voice in. And so that, uh, that was kind of the, the, the moment which I knew I, I, I felt like I had to do something. And so that was compounded because a few months later in, uh, in November 2012, the day after we won the election, uh, President Obama himself came into headquarters um, and he'd come in throughout the campaign, but this time he actually came to just to chat with us. And so he walked into our office um, with that million dollar smile ear to ear. He looked at me, he pointed at me and he said, it's it's your turn. He said, you know, this is as far as I can go. Um, you are so much further ahead in life uh, where I was at this age. And I challenge you to go out to your community and see the change that they need. And he said something to me, I, I think just kind of just change that I will always remember. He said the representation you want to see starts with you. Um, okay. and those are just words that, that just, that, that really touched me in my heart that, that, that resonated with me. And that's kind of the, the, that was kind of my guiding principles, I guess, going forward.
Okay, and so what has it been like? You know, we've um, I've interviewed other candidates. What has it been like to campaign during COVID? Because, you know, normally there would be the door knocking. You would probably have rallies. You would be out and about a lot. And now it's like people are having to go, you know, you can like dive deep, go in, you know? And I'm like, like, hear me, I'm a techie. I'm like learning techie stuff. I, I'm like, I never, I wanted to advance. You know, I have my Robin Legal website that my my webmaster Kyle and I worked on. I have a YouTube page. I have a lot of stuff that I, I probably would have eventually gotten to, but because of COVID it's kind of accelerated it. So what have you, what has it been like for you campaigning uh, in, in light of COVID? Yeah, um, it is uh, a cycle like, None other. Um, I don't think there was a candidate in the entire country that was ready, ready for this or signed up for for this. But um, you know, I don't think. Well, well I mean, I, I guess I take that back a little bit. I mean, it's it, it's 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 much different. I mean, I've worked on a number of campaigns over the last few cycles, um, and I had a playbook ready, and we we wrote out a campaign plan when I launched this thing in early 2019, um, and COVID kind of kicked that all out out the window here. And so, just like you said you know, the doors, um, voter contact was all just drastically changed. Um, I think one thing that served our campaign well um, was that we jumped out into the race very early um, and I, I was able to form a pretty large team. And what that did is it just allowed us to, to be able to, to adapt and pivot really well when it hit. And so um, we, we were on the forefront of, um, of just public health and taking things very seriously. And so when COVID hit, we were actually one of the first campaigns in the area to just completely wipe out all in-person activity. And we just started planning and figuring out how to how to switch to this digital, digital uh, voter contact that you're talking about here. And so we didn't hit it perfect. We weren't perfect on it. But what we did is we empowered all of our young interns to just come up with new ideas. Because at, at, at this point, we were um, in a climate in which no one was an expert, no one knew how to, no one knew how to campaign in a pandemic, and so we tried things like book clubs and yoga classes and just things to just kind of get people's mind off of COVID and 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 just being stuck at home. And then we also held um, town halls with you know ER physicians and and just subject matter experts to just pro to try to provide insight. And so it wasn't so much of hey you know, vote for me for these reasons, but we try to demonstrate our leadership um, in other ways and, and try to stand out and, and, and do our voter contact that way. And so, like I said, not everything hit, but, but we tried new and unique ways. And I think we were able to gain some traction uh, in, in doing that. And I did see from your website, um, voteranjeef.com, that you had, <laughs> you, you, uh, you gave out some masks as well. I saw that um, you had, some, you have tips on COVID. And then I saw that you have on there times when you were uh, passing out masks to some of the uh, first responders. What was that like? Yeah, that's actually, you know, I forgot about that. But um, my gosh, I mean, seems like May seems like centuries ago now. But um, one thing that I'm really proud of what we did is um, we kind of tried putting the partisanship aside. And we just said, hey, listen, um, there's a ton of people in our community that, that need our help. Um, and so we raised funds. Uh, we ended up raising over $5,000 and we okay. purchased um, uh, medical grade masks. And this is at a time, if you take yourselves back again to like April, when, when Detroit and, and, and Michigan were in the heat of it and, and PPP was a huge shortage and the hospitals um, okay. just didn't have the supplies they needed. Um, but on top of that, there was so many frontline essential workers out there that w weren't getting the, the news coverage um, like our doctors and our nurses, um, like food workers and, and bus drivers and, and, and those type of employees out there. So we raised money to purchase PPE and we got medical grade masks and we're able to dis distribute them to all these um, uh, frontline essential uh, employees that, that just weren't getting the, the resources they needed. And so um yeah my mom's like a I retired said, nurse and she's oh. been very concerned um about the, the treatment of you know the doctors and nurses making sure that they have all the pr proper protective gear yeah i mean it, it was i mean in the thick of it it was rough i mean like i was telling you one the one town hall we had with our er physician here he told me what 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 would be used um once per shift uh the, the mask uh they were told that this was going to be their mask through the entirety of the outbreak, um, which would have been months. And so okay. they were just reusing the same mask over and over again. And this is at one of the best hospitals right here in Southeastern Michigan. And so 
Um, yeah, I mean, there was a dire need for PPE. I'm glad Michigan as a whole is in a better spot right now than we were back then. Um, but uh, yeah, in doing I'm, that, I'm glad we have the governor that we have. I know she's come under some heat well, from the Supreme Court, whatever, conservative folk confused. But um, she has really uh, gone above and beyond as far as making sure to protect us and keep us safe. And um, not everybody has a governor like uh, like our governor. And so are. I'm... <clears throat> I'm definitely, I mean, you see like uh, communities of color where they have high comorbidities and their people have been dying. And I think she has helped to save lives in, in the senior community and, you know, the general population as well. Anybody that has comorbidities. Absolutely. And I couldn't have said it any better. I mean, we are absolutely blessed uh, to have a governor who is leading with science and just leading with reason. Uh, I, there are very few states I'd rather be in right now than Michigan. Um, you know, we are, we're doing a great job. You know, I, I know the numbers have been spiking a little bit, but we just need to remain responsible. And, you know, it's just times like this where the partisanship has to leave. You know, I, I know you mentioned about the Supreme Court ruling and, and some pushback that the governor has been getting, but number one, no one, no one was ready to deal with a pandemic. Um, and, and make decisions on the fly, especially, especially decisions that are going to affect millions of people. Um, and so I don't, I don't think she got everything 100% right, but I think she was very, very close. And she did a phenomenal job just getting us to a position where we're all safe and, and healthy. And um, unfortunately, you know, we, we had a spike, but it could have been much worse. And I think you're absolutely right. She identified uh, that communities of color were disproportionately affected. She started uh, the, the commission to deal with that, I think led by our uh, lieutenant governor. Yeah, and so, yeah our black yeah. women lawyers, we interviewed the lieutenant governor and Dr. Kyle Doon. We did that, um, it was, uh, gosh, I wanna say that was in May and had them come, we did a, a vir again, virtually. I mean, we normally, we probably would have meetings and have have you come in person, like for the black women lawyers in Michigan and our Van Zetty Humpson, but now we're learning how to do things virtually, so. Um, yeah, it's, it's, this definitely, um, this has been a, an intense experience and I'm going to your website. I see you have a, a host of issues that are, that you you've listed out. I mean, it's very detailed and, and uh, do you have, you know, you have supporting our veterans, civil rights, uh, healthcare seniors, uh, you know, so for you, what, what kind of resonates to you, like out of all these issues, what are some of the things that resonate with you the most as far as if, if once you win, you know, we're gonna pull, pull, shout it out, say, call it out that you're gonna win. Once you win and you get in there and you hit the ground running, what, what, are you, what do you wanna focus on? I mean, there's so much, Robin. It's like, it's like picking between your kids almost, unfortunately, there's, cause there's just so many issues that we have to deal with. I think, um, you know, I think first and foremost, it's, it's still this COVID issue. Um, you know, I, I know we're all sick and tired of talking about it, but we need to ensure that we are maintaining a proper approach in, in dealing with this because it's going to be a long-term issue, right? There's no magic cure that's coming in the cup in the next couple of weeks here. And so whoever wins this race and whoever's in our next legislator in Lansing has to make sure that we are still leading with science to, to limit our effects. But as much of a, of a, of a health uh, pandemic that this is, it's also a, uh, uh, an economic um, epidemic, you know, and it is going to cause just havoc on our state budget, probably for years, just because of the way the state budget set up with a lot of the money being derived from our sales tax. And, you know, with COVID kind of limiting a lot of the economic activity for a number of months, um, we're looking at a multi-billion dollar hit. And so, <clears throat> you know, just a, a couple of things that, you know, we need to tackle right away is we need to make sure that, you know, the essentials like education, healthcare, that those uh, aren't taking all of the, all of the brunt of, of that deficit. And then, Along with those issues, right? There's just so much. There's just so much systemic bias in the way things are set up. There's just, you know, community of color, communities of color, or 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 lower economic status communities that are just affected disproportionately on a lot of these issues. And so, as we rebuild and we rebound from where we're at, I just want to make sure that we're moving to a Michigan that's just more equitable in terms of doesn't matter what zip code you're living in, that you still have access to healthcare, that you still have access to a quality education. And so. You know, there's just a lot of values-based decision-making that I think we need to kind of change, I guess, in, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I know you said, you. I know you have children and I teach, um, I teach at EMU, I teach a class and that was a big uh, topic about, should we do 
Is it going to be hybrid? Is it going to be virtual? It's ended up pretty much being virtual. We've had to really keep safe. But how have you adjusted? I've talked to some of my friends that are parents. They said it was a, it was it was a big adjustment in the spring, and even now, as far as trying to figure out, do you send your kids to school? Do you homeschool them? And how has that been for you and your uh, wife? Yeah, it uh, easy is not a word that I would probably pick to describe this. This it's I think it's tough. It's really tough for for just to everyone. I know parents um, are struggling. I know um, it's, it hasn't been easy for the students or the teachers. Um, and there's really kind of no one winning um, from kind of the education community on, on, on this issue. I've just talked to so many people who are just extremely frustrated. And I think it's largely what you're saying. There's just, there's a lot of parents who want to go back. There's a lot of that aren't comfortable and they want to stay home. And so it's really hard to find broad-based solutions that works for everyone. Um, and not to get, I guess, too um, into the policy, but you know, the, the issue, the, 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 the biggest issue with our education right now is just the lack of funding. We, we're not giving our public schools the amount of money that they need. And so I'm running in District 21, which is largely comprised of Plymouth Canton schools and Van Buren schools. Right. Those two districts alone are actually some of the lowest funded districts per pupil in the entire state. Um, Plymouth Canton is actually at the, there's not a single district in all of Michigan that gets less money per pupil than Plymouth Canton. And Van Buren's just an eek higher. And oh, so um, okay. there, you know, and unfortunately, like money doesn't fix all issues, but a lack of money can absolutely cause a crisis. And, you know, that's what we that's where we're at, just like our roads. And no one no one loves the roads in Michigan. It's because we didn't fund to, to repair and, and maintain them. And our schools are on that same path right now. And so we need to invest more money. Um, I would leave it up to like the local school boards to kind of figure out the, 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 the nuance of every local jurisdiction in terms of what works best in terms of going back in person or hybrid, because there are just nuances okay. in different lo- localities, but um, it, it, it hasn't been easy. And, but we need to make sure that we're at least um, providing the resources for our administrators to be able to make the decisions to, to find solutions that, you know, every kid has the technology or access to technology or, or whatever to, to make sure that they have that the education that, uh, you know, that they need. Yeah, I've worked as an educational advocate and I've done that. It's gone. It's been three years. You know, I'm an attorney. I do criminal family law, but I um, most recently I've been doing educational advocacy and that uh, has been a big issue is making sure that all the kids, you know, one from the side of the teacher, like teachers having to go into schools and having to worry about is it, are they going to be kept safe? You know, teachers having to, you know, reach out to our office to ask about getting wills, estate planning, you know, durable power of attorney. And then from the students to making sure, um, you know, my class, uh, I teach a class that's law and the African-American experience. And we're reading Ben Crump's book. Uh, We're going to be coming up on that, the legalized genocide of colored people. And what he talks about is, and he wrote this book before the pandemic, the disparity. uh, He said one of the great equalizers for communities of color is for everybody to have laptops and internet access and that you don't find that in certain communities. You just don't, for for children of color, they don't have those resources. And, or even uh, in some of the rural areas, some of the, the, the poor white kids, you know, they don't have that. And I'm like, that's just, we need, we need to fix it. You know, and I mean, that's what yeah. you're, you're running. So it's like, you, you guys are going to have to get together and, and work on that. And uh, so what about some of the, I, I, re, I did look at your site and I know uh, you talk about uh, issues with seniors, like, and, and getting rid of uh, the, or dealing with the issue with the pension here, because I know some people have left Michigan to go to Florida where they don't have to worry about being taxed on their pension. So can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a, it's a it's a top level issue for a, a, a large portion of the senior community. Um, is just removing the the pension tax that we have here in Michigan. Um, you know, I just I, and I and I you know if you saved up for a lifetime and uh, you put your work in, I I don't see the need. And I'm so I'm absolutely on the side of re- removing the pension tax. Um, the other thing, the other big thing with the seniors is are there prescription drug costs? I know when you start talking about that, there are some uh, state. Um, some things that we can do at the state level, um, such as the HOPE plan, which is currently um, health over profits, I believe is what it stands for. But um, but a large, a large part of that is also going to be at the federal level in terms of figuring out prescription drug costs. But, you know, we need to take care of our seniors. Um, you know, I, 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 we just need to do a better job. And uh, especially now in times of a pandemic, 
Um, we've already, like I was saying, we're already going to have an economic hit. This is already, uh, and, and seniors are already high risk um, in terms of this virus. And so we need to make sure that every senior has ac access uh, to, ha to affordable health care to make sure that, um, you know, that, that they're getting the care they need to, to you know, to stay safe um, during, during this difficult time. Okay, and then what about, I mean, because I, I live in Van Buren, I've been in Canton and Belleville, all that, we're right next to each other. I, we have yep. a lot of working class folks. So what message do you have for the folks that are working class uh, as far as uh, your advocacy for them? Yeah, uh, I mean, that is uh, why we're doing this. I mean, I, um, you know, I come from a, a working family. I am part of a working family um, currently and, um, you know, and I'm endorsed and support, um, you know, labor and, and, and union households. And so one of the beautiful things about our district that you mentioned um, is just the, the, the vast range of it all the way down from Belleville to Van Buren Township to, to, to Canton. Um, and there's just, there's just so much diversity uh, within that district. And so um, down in the Southern part of my district, there is there's a heavy amount of labor and, and union households. And, um, you know, I currently work in the automotive industry it's who I am and it's what's made, it's what's made Michigan so great. And so, you know, we want to restore prevailing wage and, and overturn right to work. Um, and we want to make sure that everyone just has the ability to, to, to earn a, a great wage and a safe job. And we need to make sure that we are not putting the interests of large corporations over just everyday Americans. And so um, those are things that I think are common sense. And then unfortunately you, you get into this line of work and you understand that it's very political, unfortunately. But um, I am absolutely advocating and pounding the table um, for everyday working uh, American families because that's who I am and that's um, what I know. That's who I need. That's who I know we need to take care of in order for us to, to move to the better Michigan that we that we all want. Right. And I did see from your site, too, you talked about, um, you know, respect for women. So what would you say are some of the things that 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 speaks to you as far as advocacy for women? Yeah, I mean, that's huge. Um, and so. Listen, I, 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 there, we have a lot of progress that we still need to make. It may be 2020, um, but we still have a long way to go. And so when I talk about a better Michigan, that means many different things. Um, but from kind of a social justice standpoint, um, you know, I, I would actually be the, be the first person of color to ever represent this district. Um, you know, I right am, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm married. Um, and so I, and I've seen just kind of what my wife went through in, in delivering the, our two little boys. Um, and so for me, just at, at a very high level here, for me to ever think that I could understand the, the emotional and physical toll of, of just delivering uh, um, birth and giving birth uh, would, would be absolutely asinine. And so uh, I think first and foremost, we need to make sure that uh, we're letting women make decisions about women's bodies. And that's not being made by, by someone like me in, in, in Lansing. And so we need to, you know, absolutely, I'm absolutely championing re reproductive rights, um, you know, equal, equal pay for equal work. Uh, I think that is, a, a, again, a very, just a common sense um, ideology, but unfortunately our data shows that we're still not there. And so we need to be making sure that our women are paid the absolute same amount um, as, as any male, as a ma any male counterpart for, for equal work. And, you know, just, I guess also, you know, as a person of color, you know, I know that the journey is not the exact same um, and I'm not trying to in any way insinuate that it is, but, you know, we need to move towards a Michigan that regardless of your background, your belief, your gender, your age, that you're entitled to the, to the same uh, experience um, and, and you're able to live to your uh, um, potential and that there, there's no bias. And so, um, you know, I, I want to fight for just an, an equal and more equity across the board. And so it doesn't, again, it doesn't, it's not necessarily siloed to just being a woman or being a person of color, but regardless of your health or your wealth or who you believe in or you don't believe in, um, those are things that should not dictate your trajectory or your, your uh, you know, your, your well-being here in Michigan. And so I want to eliminate all of that bias. Yeah, what I have seen is, because I, um, my, you know, my claim to fame is I do programs educating uh, kids and the public about what to do when stopped by the police, because as a criminal defense attorney, I've been doing it, it'll be 19 years in November. So I see a lot of people who, um, I mean, it's a general message, but I mean, I, when I was seeing some of the, the issues with police brutality against black men, women, and children, that's what really called me out. I speak to all audiences. It's, it's a, a universal message. Uh, but, you know, I just talked to some high school students the other day, um, 
Upward Bound and at uh, through Pershing and Detroit and then some of the kids at Ipsy High School about tips on what to do when stopped by the police because you see you know you see what's in the news some of the things that are you know these interactions between the police and and the, the public and I'm like oh this is this is horrible so um, you know I know that the that there there has been movement to try to um, replicate some of the George Floyd legislation but I would definitely on a local level I would like to definitely see that expanded because. Kids, what the kids say to me, I've done probably anywhere from 50 to 60 programs since 2015. The kids are saying, okay, Mrs. McCoy, it's great that you're coming and you're talking to us. And sometimes I bring the police uh, so they can see that not all police are bad. You know, there's some bad apples out there, but most police are good. And I bring judges and prosecutors, defense attorneys, but the kids are like, you're talking to us, but are you talking to the police? Because there's some police out there. So, um, so I would definitely want to see some efforts on your part as well as the rest of the house, as far as putting protections in place. Um, I understand. I have friends that are police officers. I work at the, the court and they have a heavy they, I mean, right now they're risking COVID. A lot of them are on there in the front lines, but there, I, there still has to be a balancing act because you know, when, when you have some officers that lose it, they lose it. And, you know, like the George Floyd, that was like George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, things like that. Um, you know, uh, there's this discussion about defunding the police. I'll be doing a program on the 29th with um, one of the sergeants from uh, Sergeant Rush from the Washington County Police Department. And for me, I'm like, if you talk to most people of color, black folks that are in the city, they don't want to defund the police. They want um, they want more funding for the police because when the police come, they want the police when they call the police, they want the police to come. They want to be protected. So I did see from your site that you talked a lot, um, and I've talked about this as well, demilitarizing the police. So could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think you you said it very eloquently. I think that there's this is a very uh, this is a very complicated and nuanced issue that um, you know unfortunately is going to require a very holistic solution. Um, but at the at the core of it, I want to make it very clear that black lives absolutely matter. And we absolutely need to to to, to reevaluate kind of what we're doing in terms of um, the role of police. Um, but I, I, I echo everything that you just said. I think that uh, police have absolutely, um, you know, are police are are, are they're large for the large majority of police are, are very, very good. Um, and uh, there there's obviously a few bad apples out there. Um, but. There's no reason if you if you just look at George Floyd, since you mentioned his name a number of times, if you just look at that that situation there, if memory serves correct, I think that whole situation started over a feud over twenty dollars. Right. right. That's why the store owner called the police. There is no reason for someone to lose their life over twenty dollars. And so um, in demilitarizing the police, I think, um, you know, one aspect that I really like is um, kind of having putting more investing more into the mental health. Um, and making sure that we can hire more social workers. And so in a situation like that, that that is not, that, that situation over $20 is not handled um, with, with guns and, uh, and handcuffs. So in a situation like that, over $20 is handled more by a, 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 an intermediary or a social worker who can help kind of de, defeud that situation to, to not get to the point where you need to, to lose an, an innocent black life. Um, again, over just twenty dollars, and so right because uh, when you watch when you watch some of the footage, you know they've tried to show some of the more recent footage, and they're trying to say some things about like how he didn't want to get in the car and he was scared. And I'm like, uh, for me and for a lot of us that deal the police, um, a lot of us that deal with folks, um, you know, I deal. With, I represent a lot of folks that are indigent. They have mental health issues. People of color have PTSD. So you're gonna. You don't know, we don't know what George Floyd probably as a black man, I don't know, you could probably give your account as a person of color, a man of color, your experiences in, in certain situations being perceived as a threat and trying to make, you want to, you don't want to be perceived as a threat. You want, you want to make people feel comfortable, but you also want to be free. And so you see some of this footage of George Floyd is afraid to get in the car and then they're not understanding black folk people of color have ptsd if i get stopped i've gotten stopped and so when i do these what to do and stop by the police it's not like i'm just somebody on my high horse who hasn't been stopped i've been stopped and i calm down i pull over uh right away as safely as possible roll down the window um but you know you got to be careful because you don't know if you're going to get an officer you don't know what he's experienced if he's going to be jumpy and then 
you, you, what, what if you're there? We did a scenario the other day. What if you're there and it's you and your kids and you've got, you can't make any sudden moves. You got to keep it, keep your cool, calm and cool because you don't know what, what's going on. And that's exactly right. You know, um, you know, and uh, I, I think a lot of times these situations escalate uh, unnecessarily. Again, the George Floyd example was it was over twenty dollars. You know, no one needs to lose a life over twenty dollars, and so we we just need. Um, and I'm you know, and I'm probably not the the best expert in this room, but I want to be a part of the conversation in terms of figuring out what the solution is to make sure that we are not es that each of these situations is not getting escalated. And so you know, after the fact, in hindsight, it's fine. We can look at replays of the George Floyd scenario, and someone can probably pick and choose and, and, and about a oh, situation, you know, George could have been better here or there, but there's just been way too many instances over this, over the last 400 years that, that we now know that the system is broken and it does need some sort of reform. Um, and so uh, I guess just to answer your question, not be long winded about it, just demilitarizing. It just means that um, the, the, the police are not coming in like, like the SWAT team or the army into every single situation. And that's only reserved into situations in which they absolutely have to result uh, to, to those, you know, to those to those methods. Right. I feel like if you're a person of color, you should be able to have the freedom. I, you know, as I said, I've lived in other countries. I've been to South Africa. I've been to Senegal, Zimbabwe, um, in India. I've been to India where it's like a majority uh, population of color. You're able to freely walk around. You can go to the store. You don't, you can run, you can jog. You don't have to worry about going in certain neighborhoods and being profiled. And it's like, we're in America. And, you know, in my class, we, you know, we've read the constitution, the declaration of independence. We have so many, um, America is a beautiful place. Let me just put it out there because I've traveled and I come back and I want to kiss the ground. I mean, I love traveling. I love other cultures, other countries, but I want to kiss the ground when I get back to America. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, it's, that, it's a rough, but, but I still, as a person of color, I should be able to have the same freedom. If I go to India if, or if I go to Africa, the motherland, you can travel around. You don't have to, I mean, okay, you still have to be careful. You maybe certain areas you go, you can't wear flashy clothes. You can't say, hey, I'm American, come and rob me or anything like that. But um, you're free where you, there's a certain freedom there that you don't have in certain parts of America. And I mean, and that's, that's a travesty. It shouldn't be that way. And for kids too, I feel, I, I think about little kids, our little kids, what are they seeing, you know, how the adults are, are interacting with each other? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you covered a lot there, but I mean, yes, at the, at the, at, at the very forefront of it, I mean, I, I feel blessed um, that I'm born and raised in, in this country. There's no other place that I would rather be. Um, but I think that the same, at the same token, as we identify that we, how much love we have for this country, we also need to be open-minded um, and open our hearts to understand that there are ways in which our society here could can improve. Um, and that's very much true, you know, for, for the African-American community and for, you know, people of color as a whole. But um, I, you know, I will be the first one to admit that my journey, um, although presents a lot of challenges, um, is, is not as difficult as that of a, of a black male um, or a black female, for that example. But, um, you know, but as a person of color, you know, I've experienced my fair share of, of racism. But that's but the resolve we have is to fight to, towards a better Michigan and a better country. And then and that's what we want to do here. I mean, the anecdotal story we have is, uh, you know, usually I have a beard, but being a bearded brown, uh, brown skin male, I mean, every trip to the airport, I am magically the the the, the lucky one who's randomly selected 100% of the time, you know, and at first, um, after 9-11, when that happened, you know, it used to irritate me and I used to get really upset and I'd fight back. And all that led to me was just more questioning and have to go into the back room and answer questions and blah, blah, blah. And so I'm not saying that we need to become passive in our approach, but, you know, um, we absolutely need to all identify that, that we need to stop with the stereotyping and we need to, and, and we need to find ways to, to, to make a society in which, again, just, I know I sound like a broken record, but just regardless of what you look like and regardless of where you come from, that you have equal opportunity. And so um, a large part of that is uh, that I, I can't turn on the TV another time and just read the news of an innocent black person killed. Like it, it breaks my heart every single time. Um, and it's just, it's, it's to the point where, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's, I, I don't know how you explain it to your kids. Um, I don't know what we can do about it, but we all at least need to acknowledge that this is an issue, um, that, that systemic racism, systemic bias absolutely exists, and that we all need to agree that we need to move to, to eliminate that from society. 
Um, and I want to be a leading voice and pound the table and figuring out solutions to, to do just that. Yeah. And that's what I've said to my kids. I think we all have, I'm a spiritual person. I believe we all have our role. It's a matter of praying, meditating, and seeing what speaks to you. Some, some we're meant to have, we may be meant to have more people of color that are police officers that are not scared when they go into certain communities. Um, you know, some people are meant to be doctors, teachers, engineers, um, voting, voting for progressive candidates such as yourself can make a world of difference. Um, some of the kids may need to run for office. I said, if the, if the adults aren't getting it together, some of you may be meant to run for office. Um, when you talk about the beard situation, my father, he, he was in law school and his professor told him to shave his beard. So he did, he shaved his beard and he, my father is of lighter complexion. You see my father, he could be, you look at him, he's light skinned, but he, he could be Mexican, Arab, Indian. He gets, he gets it all. He's gotten it all. And I know my, um, uh, my, my former father-in-law was Kenyan. And he said when he would go to the airport, he, you know, cause normally you want to be comfortable. You want to wear a jogger suit. He would wear right. suits. He would wear, he had to change and adjust. And it's, it's sad. I was raised in a, uh, a way that we wear headscarves. And um, I even had a situation and I was, it was surprising. It wasn't from white judges. It was three black judges in the district court, 36 district that asked me to remove my headscarf. And, you know, I emailed them and we've got some group advocacy groups that they're working on that. But I was really taken aback because I'm like, when I get, you know, when you're, you're raised as a person of color, like my parents, you know, your arm, parents arm you and they say, um, they say, okay, some people are going to mess with you and you can't fight every battle because you, you just can't do every. You got to pick and choose which you're going to fight, when you're going to fight. And so sometimes you're around certain people and you're like, okay, I'm not, I'm going to let it go. Or sometimes you're like, no, no, I'm going to speak on it. And, but I had it with three black women and I'm like, that's just, it just speaks like in our class, we're talking about racial caste and we talk about the caste system um, you know, we talk about South Africa, America. I've talked, I talk again about India, about some of the caste issues. And we still have in America, some caste issues that are going on, skin color, prejudice. Um, and, and it's, it's unfortunate. And I feel like our kids should have the, your kids should have the freedom to be able to be whatever they want to be, do whatever they want to do without worrying about somebody's going to look at me because of my complexion or, you know, if I have, you know, like you said, if you have a beard, are you, are do you like my ex-husband too? He was um, mixed and people would look at him. Is he, is he Muslim? All that kind of, they do, they fit the profile um, there. When I came, when we, we went to Senegal and during, it was at, at after 9-11 or no, it was right before 9-11. We went to Senegal for our honeymoon. We come we're, we had to come back. We couldn't come back directly from Senegal to, um, New York because our airlines went bankrupt. So we had to come back through France and there was a gentleman that was sick and everybody was like standing on, I stood next to him, but everybody was like on the other side. They didn't even understand. I'm like, they thought he was Muslim. And I'm like, oh my God, this is xenophobia is out. I was in France in 95 and there was so much xenophobia against Muslim women for wearing the hijab. The French kept saying these Muslim, these, they shouldn't wear the hijab. They should be French and it's separation of church and state. And I'm like, if you're trying, if you feel that there there's some cultural issues or oppression of the women, you're the the the, the women are forced to stay at home because their cult, you know, their religion, their part of the religion says to wear the hijab. So you're gonna keep them at home. And I'm sitting there. I wrote a paper about it. I'm like, I just don't hmm. understand. And even now, we're here. I feel like we're in the twilight zone. We have a, a governor who's had people that have threatened to harm her, and instigated by our president. And I mean, it's just crazy. You should. You know, you have pedigree. You, I've looked at your background. I've looked at your website. You know, you shouldn't have to deal. People shouldn't have to deal with this, this xenophobia, these these types of experiences. We're American. We're all American. We all contribute to this society. Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, uh, yeah. I mean, you said so much there, but I think did I hear you correctly? You said your airline went bankrupt in the middle it of your honeymoon. Air Afrique. Okay. okay, maybe that's why okay. I'm not married anymore. I don't know. But anyway, um, Air Afrique. That you could go from New York to Senegal, and then they went, <laughs> they went bankrupt, oh, and no. then we had to get another ticket to go. You couldn't go directly from Senegal back to New York. You had to go from Senegal to Paris and, and come back to New York. And I didn't want to come back to New York. I was like, you know what? Um, <laughs> I was in Senegal. I was learning. You know, they speak French, so my ex and I both spoke French. And they're Wolof, and they're they're Muslim because the Muslims liberated them from the French, who were the slave masters. Oh, okay. So so we're I'm learning Wolof. I'm I'm we were only supposed to be there for two weeks. We were there for three weeks. 
And I was like, um, I don't know if I want to go back to New York. I don't know. I'm scared about going back to America right now. Even when Trump won, I told my, my current boyfriend, I said, um, you know what? Maybe we need to go. Maybe we could go to Africa. We go to India. We could go to, Asia, you know, go, go to somewhere where we could just wait this one out. But I mean, I stayed. My, you know, my students keep saying, stay, Miss McCoy. Stay, Professor McCoy. You, you're here. We're here. We're not giving up. Um, so if somebody wants to volunteer with your campaign, what do they, what do they need to do? Uh, we absolutely need the help. Uh, we, um, have about 12 days left, I believe until election day. And, um, you can go to our website, uh, which is just vote Ranjeev, uh, com, And there's a, a, a volunteer button on there and, um, we'll get them set up. And there's so many different th things that we're doing. There's in-person activities such as on the polls, we're going to be handing out literature, like poll greeting. Um, and we're actually working with a number of other progressive uh, candidates in the area. So if you do that, you can help a number of candidates just all in one go. Um, there's phone calls, text messages, um, all sorts of stuff. And so we have uh, we, we, a ton going on. We could use the help. And so if anyone's interested, please, please reach out. OK. And of course, they can go to your website and they can donate if they want to donate to your campaign as well. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, our campaign is no different than any others. And uh, it's very expensive. And a lot of campaigns... Uh, all campaigns spend a bulk of their money in the, in the final run here. And so we are in that period right now. And so every dollar absolutely helps. Um, and so, yes, the volunteer requests and donations can all be made on our website. Okay. And so I know we're, we're, we're close on time. So I, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm going to start doing this with our candidates. What's the first thing you're going to do when the, when the election is over? What are you going to do? Oh my <laughs> you have gosh. An idea? I mean, <laughs> you, you know, uh, there's so much, I, I mean, for the longest time, we planned to, to leave the country just on the theme of, I guess, everything we've talked about here. We, we're we going to, my wife and I are, are big travelers as well. We wanted to just kind of get away for a while. But, you know, unfortunately, no no one wants Americans in their country right now. So I think we are bound uh, to the states here. Um, you know, I, uh, it's kind of cliche, I guess, but I'm, I'm looking forward to just spending more time with the family. Um, I think we will just find a place to escape, whether it's just up north or something for a little while. And, uh, um, but if, if we are fortunate enough to win, um, work starts right away. And so we will, I'll be right at it. And I want to be, I'm <clears throat> very passionate about wanting to hit the ground running and just fighting for all that stuff that, that we talked about today. Right. And I love to travel. I, I did nine days in India. Um, wow. You know, I did the Golden Triangle. I got to go back. I didn't get to do Dharamsala. So I got to go back. I, you know, I got to go uh, Mumbai. I got, I got stuff to do. I got want to go to Australia, but right now, I mean, we just went, we went up north. That was it. That's all we right. were going to do right now. We, we got to work to make the, make the country, make it better so we can travel again and, and people can love us as America. I mean, people love us. I think some, you know, they love us. It's just, you know, our, the administration, they may not be too happy about what's happening there. So I, I, I right. know some people feel sorry for us, but, um, but I mean, I don't know. We're in this mess. We, we've, we've all got to work to get out of it. So um, thank you thank for you. doing this interview. Um, I'm glad that we were able to connect. And anybody that's out there, you can go to voteranjeef.com if you want to help Ranjeef. And also, I want to ask real quickly, Ranjeef, what does your name mean? It actually this is a very timely in in, in light of uh, I don't, I'm sure you heard uh, the senator uh, Purdue was making fun of uh, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris's uh, name and the pronunciation of it, and so. The Biden Harris ticket had this "my name is" kind of thing trending for a couple of days, and so "my name is" uh, actually means victorious. Oh, um, so see, you got it's uh, in the name. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we gotta hope I live up to my name here in, on November third. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, victorious out there. Yeah, I'm big on my background's cultural anthropology, so that's why I just I'm into etymology, all of that. Um. So. Oh, cool. Um. So blessings to you and your family. Um. I put my signs up there. I already voted, y'all. I early voted. I already voted for Ranjeev. So hey. Right. So, Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So good luck to you. And um, yeah. And uh, just have a, have a blessed day and I'll talk with you later. Yeah. I appreciate the chat. Thank you for having me on. And um, I, I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, sure. All right. Take care. Okay. You too.